to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We're here once again today, just like any other time. We have another special guest. We have the one and only Victoria Peltier, and she's going to tell us everything about her life journey, not just being in books, being an author. She has some amazing books that you need to check out that we're going to dive into, but she also is a business leader. She has over 20 plus years of experience in corporate executive experience. She's been on uh, as a board director, she has amazing leadership skills. She has a nickname as a turnaround queen and CEO whisper from her former colleagues and employers. I'm not even going to spend 30 minutes on her resume because it'll take too long to go through every little piece. So I got to just bring you on the show. Victoria, and say, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm very happy to be here. I appreciate your time because there's no way I can spend 25 minutes going through your resume. It's, it's very long and impressive. So short term, when it comes to leadership perspective, you have a ton of experience in that. You became a very young uh, chief operating officer at the age of 24. You became president by the age of 35, CEO at the age of 41. But in between those chapters are a lot of details. So for the audience, kind of tell us a little bit about your early success in your careers? Yeah, sure. I am. Um, I did start working very, very early. Uh, I started working at age 11 uh, in a hair salon. And then by 14, I was the assistant manager of the uh, shoe store I worked at in high school. Uh, I graduated at 16 and went off to university with plans of becoming a lawyer. However, um, I worked at a bank while I was in university and got promoted through the ranks quite quickly and just realized how much I loved being a leader. I was really enjoying the corporate world. And so I ended up thinking I was taking a year off before law school, but never went um, because I'm a big you know, believer in following your joy and passion, um, and the things that bring you value both personally and professionally. And so I was running large scale banking operations when I got recruited to that COO role for a large outsourcing organization that had large banking clients, which was one of the reasons they were attracted to me. Uh, and I, that was this business to business environment and I loved it. So I have stayed in that uh, like profession broadly ever since. However, I've kind of zigged and zagged throughout the world of B2B professional services, a decade in corporate travel businesses. Um, I've been running human capital businesses, consulting technology um, and outsourced operations. And I, I also am very passionate about diversity, equity, inclusion, and like you know, more broadly, social equity and justice. So I spend a lot of my time advocating uh, for such. I do a lot of writing. I sit on boards. I'm a keynote speaker. Um, and and by the way, I'm also, a you know, a mom and wife, fitness fanatic and a bunch of things I try to all fit in, but very much living my my life with intention and purpose. What you just said just kind of spoke to what I said earlier. Your resume is so long that uh, it'll take us probably an hour to... <laughs> discuss every detail in the show, but to focus on the leadership skills that you have, you became a CEO at the age 30, uh, excuse me, 41, but you had a lot of insight and a lot of strategies and principles along the way that you, you know, held close to you, kind of touched on that the audience. How did those uh, different strategies and principles help pave the way to your leadership role as a CEO? I am an incredibly like values driven individual and, in, and leader in business, um, you know, incredibly driven through like integrity and ethics. I've actually left companies where that was compromised. However, I, I will actually state, I mean, it wasn't all like sunshine and roses. I, um, I had to pivot at one point. I learned in my mid to late twenties that I had a nickname as the Iron Maiden um, at work. And that's, you know, at first I was like, oh, well that's unfortunate, but I figured it was a result of the fact that I, I had very successfully like turned around the business, strong performance management, had to make really tough business decisions. But what I actually realized later was that um, my fears and insecurities um, as a human and as a young female leader, um, 
never allowed me to show any emotions or, or, or any kind of vulnerability, you know, as a, you know, 24 year old executive, the only woman, um, and probably two decades younger than everyone else. And that remained the same for a long time. I'm still actually one of very few women. Um, uh, I've, the age is caught, caught up, but um, I was afraid I didn't want to give anyone any reason to question me. And so my leadership style has evolved into what I now refer to as more of a whole human leadership approach. So beyond being values driven, focused on doing the right thing and being incredibly operating with an incredible amount of integrity and ethics, I also very much focus on being the kind of leader I'd want to work for. And that means being um, authentic, uh, being incredibly transparent with communications to the extent that I can. Sometimes there's some things that can't be shared, but otherwise giving people clarity around why we're making the decisions we're making. Uh, I've learned to be much more vulnerable telling I had a pretty horrible childhood and backstory. That's part of why I focused on being so strong from a work perspective. I could control what happened at work. I couldn't control what happened outside of it. And so sharing that to give people um, the sense of like that there's safety and creating vulnerability, that there's a sense of belonging and inclusion that they can bring their whole selves to work though. But that wasn't, that wasn't natural for me. Um, and so I had to, lean into the things that made me really uncomfortable and talking about and sharing emotions, sharing, um, you know, some of the vulnerable moments wasn't comfortable, but I truly think that if you're not challenging yourself and leaning into what makes you uncomfortable, the growth, um, is not going to come. Being uncomfortable is a sign of two things is a sign of what you just said. Growth opportunity is a sign or, Maybe in some situations, that's time for change. It's time for something to be adjusted. You know, your mindset, you know, whatever it is that's holding you back. It's usually it could be ourselves. It could be our past. It could be, it could be any numerous things. For you, you mentioned about your younger self. What were some of the things that you had to overcome in your younger self that put you in position to where you are today? I'm, um, I was born to a, a drug addicted teenage mother who was very abusive to me, um, pushed upstairs, downstairs. I had a cigarette in my eye that I wore a patch for, for months. That was a, an act of carelessness, not intention, but that was very, just very typical of life with Julie, my biological mother. And so I was in and out of the child welfare system. She'd put me up. I think I was taken away. And then I'm fortunate, however, that a couple that she often gave me to after one of these episodes, after a few times of this happening, they asked to adopt me, to take me away from her. And she agreed. Um, but I was scarred both literally and figuratively. I was this, even though I actually, I was adopted at like around age four. So it's not like I was only with her for a handful of years, but I definitely remember all of them. Um, but knowing that a mother could do that and then knowing that a mother could let me go. And then as I aged and I realized that none of her, her mother, her sisters, no one on that, no one, they knew what was going on and let it happen. Like, and no one took me in. Like, so I, I lived with this self-doubt and um, feelings of rejection for a long time. My mom, my mom being the woman that raised me was incredible and spent a lot of time getting me to be really self-aware and self-reflective around why I was feeling and acting the way I was. Um, but uh, I was I lower socioeconomic home. So my dad was a janitor. My mom was a secretary. And my mom said to me at um, probably age 11, she's like, Tori, you need, you need to do better than us. And she was just trying to push me from an education standpoint. Although I did fairly well, I skipped a couple of grades, but she also wanted to make sure vocationally I went down a very different path. But she didn't need to say that because um, the biology and the circumstance are what I actually attribute pretty significantly to being my why and the creation of my drive. I was determined I will be better than biology or circumstance. Um, and so that's what really kind of propel, propelled me forward. And I had lots of other adversities. I was raped in my teens. There was just a number of other things that happened. It's, but I developed a, an incredible amount of resilience in a much healthier way than I had as a child. Um, and all of those things like have enabled me to be the human I am today, the kind of mother that I am today, the leader I am in business today. Once again, listen, on Refocus Radio talking to our guest today, Victoria Peltier, and you have a website that people can go to. I'll have it in my show notes. But touch on the fact that you are not just a businesswoman, 
not just a speaker, not just an author, but you also are passionate about uh, leadership and diversity. Mm. You've been through a lot of things early on in your life, but none of that has stopped your full potential of what you chose to become. At what age did you notice that that drive was not going to be easily put out? I I don't know that I, there was a particular age. I just feel like I rolled with the punches so much and I was just determined that nothing was going to stop me. I feel like, although I, I talked about developing it or having a healthy, healthier way of being resilient, um, I, I still think there's a little bit of DNA some, somehow in there, like fight or flight. I am a fighter. Yeah. Um, I sign a lot of my social media um, posts with hashtag unstoppable. Uh, and, and it's just that I think, y- you know, from childhood, I don't know the age, but like, I just, nothing was going to stop me. I was just going to like plow through, move through. And it probably wasn't really until my twenties where, um, you know, stepping into some of those senior roles and, you know, having some discrimination for a variety of reasons that I just like plowed through and was like, no, 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 like screw this. Like I'm, I am doing it. You are not stopping me. It then became like part of my vernacular um, to talk about that and being like unstoppable and achieving everything. I set my heart, heart on whatever goals or objectives those were. Some people have difficulty in doing that. What you just explained, because confidence takes a key role in how far you are willing to go as a person versus fear can hold you back for a long time before you decide, okay, I'm going. I'm not just going to sit here and, and allow this to continue. How did you... Uh, navigate those decisions because it's one thing to make those decisions to do this and do that but it's another thing to actually apply it reassess reevaluate and position yourself to do better i am the other hashtag i sign off with beyond unstoppable is no excuses but what i what i mean by that although i and i'll tell you it drives my children insane um who are now adults by the way (laughs) um for for me it's about having choice and so, um, you know, I, I tell your listeners to, as I said earlier, you need to step into your fear. You need to, you know, one toe in, it gets easier to put the full foot in later, right? One step in front of one foot in front of the other is progress. Um, so just, you need to like get comfortable with fear. There's um, a quote that I love by George Adair and it says, everything you've ever wanted lives on the other side of fear. So I tell the listeners, like, you need to embrace it and get comfortable with that. And then the next part related to that, you know, no excuses is that you have choice. Obstacles are going to come our way. Trauma or adversity might occur to us for which we're not in control over. What you are in control over is how you're going to move forward. And so even if you're on, let's say it's from a work perspective, you are on unhappy. You control what you can control. Try to change the situation. And at some point, no choice is a choice also. You don't get to continue to bitch about the situation if you make, <laughs> if there's no action. But you're the, you're the CEO of your own life. Uh, and so you choose what's going to happen. And we can't control negative stuff is going to come our way. Again, how you choose to respond to it. I'm a deeply emotional person. My best friend has nicknamed me Turtle in that I have a very tough exterior, but I'm all soft and marshmallowy on the inside. Like I'm the t- type of person who cries at like the Humane Society commercials. So I'm, it's okay. Feel the emotion when stuff comes our way, but we then need to be strategically intentional of how we are going to move forward. You have won Mentor of the Year Award in 2020. You have a passion, like I said earlier, for leadership. And you have a story that backs it up because what you went through didn't stop you. It pushed you even further. When you deal with people and and deal with other people's uh, outlook on life, whether it's fear or this excuse or that pain or whatever it may be, how do you help people see their flaws but not be defined by their flaw? Uh, By... Yeah, this is about 
it talked about creating safe space and a sense of belonging. It's, you know, making, creating an environment where people can recognize that it's okay to talk about our unique experiences, um, whether, you know, that be like the lived experiences we've had, the worked experiences, et cetera. But that's what, like, that's in many cases, that's pe- people's superpower. And so for me, I, I wouldn't have been as open about my my origin story, if you will, until probably about 10 years ago. I, I told it certainly in like smaller settings. But one day it shifted for me when, you know, for International Women's Day, I was a keynote speaker and I decided to say it on a stage. And the amount of people that came like to talk to me afterwards and subsequently, you know, ask for some kind of mentorship, I realized that by sharing my story, it could allow others to see themselves in me, my very different lived experience, maybe the air trauma they might have experienced, but that you can get past it. And in my case, I've demonstrated that it has become my superpower. You know, me embracing, I don't, I live with no regrets. All that's happened to me is maybe who I am. So that's how I do it by talking to others, by sharing my own story, by encouraging and creating a safe space for them to talk about theirs and figure out how to shape it into part of their narrative and potentially their own superpower. And earlier you mentioned the word unstoppable. You have a book that's actually titled Unstoppable Stories of Change Makers Who Dare to Make a Difference. And you also have a book, Influence Unleashed. You being able to not just articulate your your story on stage or stages in corporate offices and mentorship programs, but also through writing as a publisher. I mean, you literally what your title says unstoppable. Like you're doing all these things and you're doing it well. When you look at what you've been able to do, what is your core value? Or principles that has sustained your success. I mean, that's tough. I think my my nature um, and my like strive to be better, you know, today than I was yesterday, um, is a big part of what has allowed me to have the success that I've had. I'm also a big believer um, in. Um, I describe myself as a multi-potentialite. It's a very diverse interest and passions all around. But I'm a big subscriber to the fact that where there's conviction, there's capacity. And that means you make time and space for the things that have meaning for, for you. So I've, you know, written books and, um, you know, been a C-suite executive traveling in some cases, like 90% of the time on the road. And I've been able to be a mother And I work out six days a week. At one point, I coach my kids' hockey team. Like, I do all of those things, but I create the capacity to do it. And I'm able to do or have it all, which I don't really love when people ask me how how that, because for me, it's work-life integration. But I do that by making compromises and trade-offs at the appropriate times. There's times where I've done that for my career, and there's times that I've done that for my family. But that ultimate drive to be better than I was the day before is most uniquely what um, has driven my success. Having that mindset at a young age, I remember you said earlier in the interview, I believe you said you were 11, when you was made aware that more is ahead from early, early on. You made a choice and you stuck with that. Why do you think for some people it's, they always put themselves uh, in the way? when it comes to their goals, when it comes to, you know, their dreams, when it comes to just being the best professional they can be. Why do you think that some people generally always put themselves in the way? Because it's hard work to do the alternative. Um, It's easy to blame circumstance. It's easy to blame others. Making a choice to put in the hard work and the effort, whether that's leaning into the things you're, that make you fearful or uncomfortable, or whether it's, you know, not, I joke with people that there's your nine to five and then there's your five to nine. So those who want to start side hustles or have a passion project, well, if you Netflix all night, that's a choice. Yeah. 
You know, it's easy to sit on the couch and do that. It's hard to wake up for, as I said, I'm, I work out six days a week. The only time I do that is in the morning. It will not work for me to do it later. That means I make a choice. I go to bed early so that I can wake up at 5.30 or 6 a.m. or whatever I need to get into the gym. So I think people get in their way because it's far too easy yeah. to take no action or the easy action. Yeah, that's perfect what you just said. Once again, talking to our guest, Peltier. She has a website. I'm going to put it in the show notes because it's definitely spelled different than how it's um, pronounced. But when you look at uh, business leaders, you've been around many. What would you say makes a leader worth following? If that makes sense. It, it, it does. I am um, because I myself, when I got that nickname is the Iron Maiden, I realized people in business likely feared me and wouldn't want to follow me mm. into the proverbial fire or even just into to the next role or company. Yeah. And so I think what creates the strong followership from a leadership perspective is someone who is courageous and bold. And that means, you know, sometimes taking the really difficult um, actions because it's the right thing for the stakeholders in the business, our clients, our customers, our employees, shareholders. Um, and it means things like to, tough things like performance managing people. I don't, unfortunately I've had to exit many people from business over the years. I don't love that, but that's me being courageous and bold and doing what's necessary for the business. But more importantly, it's about the, what I refer to as this whole human leadership approach. That means you are vulnerable, creating a space for other people to do it. You are authentic. You are transparent in your communications. You have your teams back. I ultimately have accountability for my team's performance. Um, and with that means I'm deeply loyal, you know, to them, I'm going to coach and develop them to ensure they're successful or find them a better role for them. Um, and, um, and, and I've done that time and time again. And so I think that being courageous, being bold, being vulnerable, authentic, being transparent, um, recognizing the whole human that sits in front of me as well, um, and creating empathy and space for, for their experiences are a big part of creating that followership. When it comes to brand, you know a whole lot about that. What <laughs> is so important about establishing the brand, what it means, the core of it, but also, like you said, having accountability for what it is that you are leading because you can have a brand, but if you don't have that personal attachment to it, then it's just colors and letters. Yeah, I've, um, I spent a lot of years really focused on developing a strong personal brand and encouraging my team members to do the same. At the end of the day, people do business with people they like and trust and want to do business with. So, you know, that my Influence Unleashed book is a personal branding book and it comes on the heels of LinkedIn ranked me when I worked at IBM, the number one social seller worldwide. That big part of that social seller is around your brand. It's also around how you engage with your network, et cetera. And so IBM asked me to develop training for other executives. And it's because people fall, fall at, I'm going to say at one point, most people think their brand is what you do and who you do it for. That's only one element that gives you some credibility in the space. It says you have education or experience doing something, but it doesn't go get to the human part. So you need to be building a brand that's based upon, yes, what you do, what your expertise is, what your subject matter expertise or thought leadership, but it's also about who you are as a human. What stories are you going to tell? What, how do you talk about the interests, passions, or values that you have? Next, it's around what makes you different from other people that do what you do. Why would people choose to hire you or want to work with or buy from you um, compared to one of your competitors? So get very clear at articulating the differentiation. And sometimes that second and third part are intertwined. The who, who you are, the values and interests are is also a differentiator, but get clear on those things. And the last one is start with the end in mind. What's What's the legacy or impact? What do you want to be known for? So I've been really successful in business, but when I die, I don't want my tombstone to talk about sales and revenue and profit. I wanted to talk about the impact I had on the people I worked with, on my community and the world at large, around things like social justice and equity, around diversity and inclusion, around being a solid mentor, and by the way, raising two really good humans. 
Yeah, I, I, I like what you're saying there because I feel a lot of times we can get caught up into just the surface of things. Like we, I, I was telling this to someone last week, we get so caught up in the death scroll. We want to see everybody's achievements and oh my God, oh my God, okay, I got to do this, I got to do that. We always kind of, we always want to compete, which is not bad, but you got to have a healthy balance and get to that human perspective like you just touched on. There's a human side to everything. Mm -hmm. Without that human connection. I mean, for this show, like I told you in the green room, he started at a barber shop. Clippers, noise in the background. It's like, me personally, I'm embarrassed to listen to some of those episodes. It's like, man, I didn't know what I was doing. The mixing game was not on par. I mean, it's a lot of things that was flawed, but a lot of people love it. Because to see where we are now versus where we were then, it's obvious that we've grown. I mean, grown like crazy. Hmm. And that's the way it should be. Had a guy who was a former Air Force, and uh, he says, I'll, I'll never forget. He said, no one cares about the day you're born or the day you die. It's the dash. What did you do? within that dash. And when he said that, I got chills. I'm like, wow. <laughs> you know, you got to start somewhere. But you want to finish strong. Because if you finish strong, then you didn't waste your time. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I've heard the story about the dash before. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's bang on. When people want to learn more about you, they can visit your website like I said I have in the show notes but uh, how can someone who's interested in seeing resources that you have available what's the best way they can be in touch with you and if they want to have you speak somewhere what's the best way they can uh, reach out to you and explore that opportunity my website, which you said is in the show notes, but it's victoria-peltier.com. There, there's sample videos of me on stage and speaking, although hopefully you're, um, you know, through the listeners today, they're getting a sense of that. But a lot of the 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 content I write is shared there. So they can go to the, to the website, connect with me from there, or link out and connect with me on the various different social media platforms from that site. I know I'm, I'm bad at saying last question because it's always getting new ideas when I hear the guest talk, but I promise the last one. We're still early in the new year. If you had a message for young entrepreneurs or even those who work, you know, they're trying to work up the corporate ladder, what would your message be to any individual out there who wants to be like you and your personal story, striving for the best version of themselves? What would your message be to that individual? There, that there is no better time than now. As I said, you know, they're, everyone's the, you know, the CEO of their own life and, and career. And so design it the way you want it. Don't let anyone confine you and tell you how far or wide you may or may not go. You create the, your own version of what unstoppable means for you and take action now. You know, no excuses. Like, think about that. Like, there's no, stop waiting for the perfect time. There isn't. Let's, let, let's just move forward. I'd encourage them to, like, embrace the new year. I'm not one who does New Year's resolutions, but, like, just embrace it. The time is now. It's still like, a, there's still a bit of a reset at the, at the start of the year. So set the intention and take action. We've been talking to Victoria Peltier, and you go to her website. It's going to be in the show notes, but it's victoria-peltier.com. And I love what you said moments ago because if, if people don't start now, like it's been said part in the legends, tomorrow may never come. So you have now. That's what you do have guaranteed. So once again, Victoria, I want to say thank you for your time. Thank you.